let us now and here highly resolve to resume the country's uninterrupted march along the path of real pro progress, of real justice, of real equality for all of our citizens, great and small. People know the Democratic Party is the People's Party, and the Republican Party is the party of special interest, and it always has been and always will be. I come out of the Democratic Party, which in this century has produced Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman. One sentence in the platform we built says it all. The most important family policy, urban policy, labor policy, minority policy, and foreign policy America can have is an expanding entrepreneurial economy of high-wage, high-skilled jobs. Four years ago, I stood before you and told you my story. The brief union between a young man from Kenya and a young woman from Kansas who weren't well off or well known, but shared a belief that in America, their son could achieve whatever he put his mind to. It is that promise that's always set this country apart, that through hard work and sacrifice, each of us can pursue our individual dreams, but still come together as one American family to ensure that the next generation can pursue their dreams as well. There have been differences of opinion, and that's the democratic way. Those differences have been settled by a majority vote, as they should be. Now it's time for us to get together and beat the common enemy. Pledges which are made so eloquently are made to be kept. The rights of man, the civil and economic rights, essential to the human dignity of all men, are indeed our goal and are indeed our first principle. Our values, freedom, democracy, individual rights, free enterprise, they have triumphed all around the world. And yet, just as we have won the Cold War abroad, we are losing the battles for economic opportunity and social justice here at home. Now that we have changed the world, it's time to change America. We meet at one of those defining moments, a moment when our nation is at war, our economy is in turmoil, and the American promise has been threatened once more. Tonight, more Americans are out of work, and more are working harder for less. More of you have lost your homes, and even more are watching your home values plummet. More of you have cars you can't afford to drive, credit cards, bills you can't afford to pay, and tuition that's beyond your reach. Now, these challenges are not all of government's making, but the failure to respond is a direct result of a broken politics in Washington. I recommended an increase in the minimum wage. What'd they get? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I suggested that the schools in this country are crowded, teachers underpaid, that there are a shortage of teachers. One of the greatest national needs, more and better schools. I urge the Congress to provide $300 million to aid the states in meeting the present educational crisis. Congress did nothing about it. The obligation to devote every effort of my mind and spirit to lead our party back to victory and our nation to greatness. I have news for the forces of greed and the defenders of the status quo. Your time has come and gone. It's time for a change in America. This country's more decent than one where a woman in Ohio on the brink of retirement finds herself one illness away from disaster after a lifetime of hard work. We're a better country than one where a man in Indiana has to pack up the equipment that he's worked on for 20 years and watches it shipped off to China and then chokes up as he explains how he felt like a failure when he went home to tell his family the news. We are more compassionate than a government that lets veterans sleep on our streets and families slide into poverty. 
that sits that sits on its hands while a major American city drowns before our eyes. Foreign policy should be the policy of the whole nation and not a, po a policy of one party or the other. Partisanship should stop at the water's edge. And under any circumstances, the victory we seek in November will not be easy. We know that in our hearts. We know that our opponents will invoke the name of Abraham Lincoln on behalf of their candidate, despite the fact that his political career has often seemed to show charity towards none and malice for all. Frankly, I'm fed up with politicians in Washington lecturing the rest of us about family values. Our families have values, but our government doesn't. Tonight I say to the people of America, to Democrats and Republicans and independents across this great land, enough! Let me warn you, and let me warn the nation against the smooth evasion that says, of course we believe these things, we believe in social security. We believe in work for the unemployed. We believe in saving homes. Cross our hearts and hope to die. We believe in all these things. But we do not like the way the present administration is doing them. Just turn them over to us. We will do all of them. We will do more of them. We will do them better. And most important of all, the doing of them will not cost anybody anything. The Republican Party, as I said a while ago, favors the privileged few and not the common everyday man. Ever since its inception, that party has been under the control of special privilege. Our task is not merely one of itemizing Republican failures, nor is that wholly necessary. For the families forced from the farm do not need us to tell them of their plight. The unemployed miners and textile workers know that the decision is before them in November. The old people without medical care the families without a decent home, the parents of children without a decent school. They all know that it's time for change. I want an America where family values live in our actions, not just in our speeches. An America that includes every family, every traditional family and every extended family. Every two-parent family, every single-parent family, and every foster family, every family. You see, we Democrats have a very different measure of what constitutes progress in this country. We measure progress by how many people can find a job that pays the mortgage. Whether you can put a little extra money away at the end of each month so you can someday watch your child receive her college diploma. We measure progress in the 23 million new jobs that were created when Bill Clinton was president. When the average American family saw its income go up $7,500 instead of go down $2,000 like it has under George Bush. We measure the strength of our economy not by the number of billionaires we have or the profits of the Fortune 500 but by whether someone with a good idea can take a risk and start a new business, or whether the waitress who lives on tips can take a day off and look after a sick kid without losing her job. An economy that honors the dignity of work. The fundamentals we use to measure economic strength are whether we are living up to that fundamental promise that has made this country great. A second Bill of Rights, under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all, regardless of station or race or creed. Among these 
are the right to a useful and remunerative job, the right to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation, the right of every farmer to raise and sell his products at a return which will give him and his family a decent living, the right of every businessman, large and small, to trade in an atmosphere of freedom, freedom from unfair competition and domination by monopolies at home or abroad, the right of every family to a decent home, the right to adequate medical care, and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health, the right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, sickness, accidents, and unemployment, the right to a good education. All of these rights spell security, and after this war is won, we must be prepared to move forward in the implementation of these rights to new goals of human happiness and well-being. For unless there is security here at home, there cannot be lasting peace in the world. All the Republicans came here a few weeks ago and they wrote up a platform. I hope you've all read that platform. They adopted a platform, and that platform had a lot of promises and statements of what the Republican Party is for and what they would do if they were in power. They promised to do in that platform a lot of things I've been asking them to do and that they've refused to do when they had the power. Woodrow Wilson's new freedom promised our nation a new political and economic framework. Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal promised security and succor to those in need. But the new frontier of which I speak is not a set of promises. It is a set of challenges. It sums up not what I intend to offer to the American people, but what I intend to ask of them. It appeals to their pride. If you are sick and tired of a government that doesn't work to create jobs, if you're sick and tired of a tax system that's stacked against you, if you're sick and tired of exploding debt and reduced investments in our future, or if, like the great civil rights pioneer, Fannie Lou Hamer. You're just plain old sick and tired of being sick and tired. <laughs> then, join us, work with us, win with us, and we can make our country the country it was meant to be. Supporting public education, supporting complete separation, of church and state, and resisting pressure from sources of any kind should be clear by now to everyone. For over two decades, he subscribed to that old discredited Republican philosophy. Give more and more to those with the most and hope that prosperity trickles down to everyone else. In Washington, they call this the ownership society. But what it really means is that you're on your own. Out of work, tough luck, you're on your own. No health care, the market will fix it, you're on your own. Born into poverty, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Even if you don't have boots, you are on your own. Well, it's time for them to own their failure. It's time for us to change America. For nearly four years now, you have had an administration which instead of pulling its thumbs, has rolled up its sleeves. And I can assure you that we will keep our sleeves rolled up. We had to struggle 
with the old enemies of peace, business and financial monopoly, speculation, reckless banking, class antagonism, sectionalism, war profiteering. They had begun to consider the government of the United States as a mere appendage to their own affairs. And we know now that government by organized money is just as dangerous as government by organized mob. Never before in all our history have these forces been so united against one candidate as they stand today. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. Stay on this and ask you, how big a role does corporate America play in a healthy economy, and will corporate America love a President Sanders? No, I think they won't. So Hillary and I have a difference. The CEOs of large multinationals may like Hillary. They ain't going to like me. And Wall Street is going to like me even less. And the reason for that is we've got to deal with the elephant in the room, which is the greed, recklessness, and illegal behavior on Wall Street. When you have six financial institutions in this country, they issue two-thirds of the credit cards and one-third of the mortgages, when three out of four of them are larger today than when we bail them out because they are too big to fail. We've got to reestablish Glass-Steagall. We have got to break the large financial institutions up. So I don't think, having said that, I don't think I'm going to get a whole lot of campaign contributions from Wall Street. I don't have a super PAC. I don't want campaign contributions from corporate America. And let me be clear. While there are some great corporations creating jobs and trying to do the right thing, in my view, and I say this very seriously, the greed of the billionaire class, the greed of Wall Street is destroying this economy and is destroying the lives of millions of Americans. We need an economy that works for the middle class, not just a handful of billionaires. And I will fight and lead to make that happen. I know that there are those who say that we want to turn everything over to the government. I don't at all. I want the individuals to meet their responsibilities. And I want the states to meet their responsibilities. But I think there is also a national responsibility. The argument has been used against every piece of social legislation in the last 25 years. The people of the United States individually could not have developed the Tennessee Valley. Collectively, they could have. A cotton farmer in Georgia or a peanut farmer or a dairy farmer in Wisconsin or Minnesota, he cannot protect himself against the forces of supply and demand in the marketplace. But working together in effective governmental programs, he can do so. I don't believe in big government, but I believe in effective governmental action. And I think that's the only way that the United States is going to maintain its freedom. It's the only way that we're going to move ahead. I think we can do a better job. I think we're going to have to do a better job if we are going to meet the responsibilities which time and events have placed upon us. We cannot turn the job over to anyone else. If the United States fails, then the whole cause of freedom fails. And I think it depends in great measure on what we do here in this country. The reason Franklin Roosevelt was a good neighbor in Latin America was because he was a good neighbor in the United States. Because they felt that the American society was moving again. I want us to recapture that image. I want people in Latin America and Africa and Asia to start to look to America, to see how we're doing things, to wonder what the President of the United States is doing, and not to look at Khrushchev or look at the Chinese Communists. That is the obligation upon our generation. In 1933, Franklin Roosevelt said in his inaugural that this generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. I think our generation of Americans has the same rendezvous. The question now is, can freedom be maintained under the most severe attack, attack it has ever known? I think it can be. 
And I think in the final analysis, it depends upon what we do here. I think it's time America started moving again. This election is about putting power back in your hands and putting the government back on your side. It's about putting people first. The Republican platform urges extending and increasing Social Security benefits. Think of that. Increasing Social Security benefits. And yet when they had the opportunity, they took 750,000 people off the Social Security roll. We are not here to curse the darkness. We are here to light a candle. As Winston Churchill said on taking office some 20 years ago, if we open a quarrel between the present and the past, we shall be in danger of losing the future. Today, our concern must be with that future. For the world is changing, the old era is ending, the old ways will not do. Abroad, the balance of power is shifting, New and more terrible weapons are coming into use. One third of the world may be free, but one third is the victim of a cruel repression, and the other third is rocked by poverty and hunger and disease. Our people are pleading for change, but government is in the way. It's been hijacked by privileged private interests. It's forgotten who really pays the bills around here. It's taken more of your money and giving you less in return. We have got to go beyond the brain-dead politics in Washington and give our people the kind of government they deserve, a government that works for them. What is that American promise? It's a promise that says each of us has the freedom to make of our own lives what we will, but that we also have obligations to treat each other with dignity and respect. It's a promise that says the market should reward, dr drive, and innovation and generate growth, but the businesses should live up to their responsibilities to create American jobs, to look out for American workers, and play by the rules of the road. Ours, ours is a promise that says government cannot solve all our problems, but what it should do is that which we cannot do for ourselves protect us from harm, and provide every child a decent education, keep our water clean and our toys safe, invest in new schools and new roads and science and technology. Our government should work for us, not against us. It should help us, not hurt us. It should ensure opportunity, not just for those with the most money and influence, but for every American who's willing to work. That's the promise of America, the idea that we are responsible for ourselves, but that we also rise or fall as one nation. The fundamental belief that I am my brother's keeper, I am my sister's keeper. That's the promise we need to keep. That's the change we need right now. Today, we are now the defenders of the stronghold of democracy and of equal opportunity. The haven of the ordinary people of this land and not of the favored classes or the powerful few. The battle cry is just the same now as it was in 1932, and I paraphrase the words of Franklin D. Roosevelt as he issued the challenge in accepting his nomination at Chicago. This is more than a political call to arms. Give me your help, not to win votes alone, but to win in this new crusade and keep America secure and safe for its own people. This country faces so many serious challenges, so many great opportunities, so many burdensome responsibilities, that I hope that it is to those great matters that we can address ourselves in the coming months. And if this statement of mine makes it easier to concentrate on our nation's problems, then I'm glad that I have made it. The United States has to accept its full responsibility for leadership in international affairs. We have been the backers and the, the people who organized and started the United Nations, first started under that great Democratic President Woodrow Wilson as the League of Nations. 
The League was sabotaged by the Republicans in 1920, and we must see that the United Nations continues a strong and going body so we can have everlasting peace in the world. It is time, in short, for a new generation of leadership. All over the world, particularly in the newer nations, young men are coming to power. Men who are not bound by the traditions of the past. Men who are not blinded by the old fears and hate and rivalry. Young men who can cast off the old slogans and the old delusions. The thing that makes me angriest about what's gone wrong in the last years is that our government has lost touch with our values while our politicians continue to shout about them. I'm tired of it. Change means a tax code that doesn't reward the lobbyists who wrote it, but the American workers and small businesses who deserve it. Change happens. Change happens because the American people demand it, because they rise up and insist on new ideas and new leadership, a new politics for a new time. America, this is one of those moments. His party is the party of the past, the party of memory. I shall ask for adequate and decent law for displaced persons in place of this anti-Semitic, anti-Catholic law which this 80s Congress passed. Their pledge is to the status quo, and today there is no status quo. I was raised to believe the American dream was built on rewarding hard work. But we have seen the folks in Washington turn the American ethic on its head. For too long, those who play by the rules and keep the faith have gotten the shaft. And those who cut corners and cut deals have been rewarded. People are working harder than ever, spending less time with their children, working nights and weekends at their jobs instead of going to PTA and Little League or Scouts. And their incomes are still going down. Their taxes are still going up. And the cost of health care, housing, and education are going through the roof. Meanwhile, more and more of our best people are falling into poverty even though they work 40 hours a week. Individual responsibility and mutual responsibility. That's the essence of America's promise. The Chinese communists have always had a large population. But they are important and dangerous now because they are mounting a major effort within their own country. The kind of country we have here, the kind of society we have, the kind of strength we build in the United States will be the defense of freedom. If we do well here, if we meet our obligations, if we're moving ahead, then I think freedom will be secure around the world. If we fail, then freedom fails. Therefore, I think the question before the American people is, are we doing as much as we can do? Are we as strong as we should be? Are we as strong as we must be if we're going to maintain our independence? And if we're going to maintain and hold out the hand of friendship to those who look to us for assistance, to those who look to us for survival? He won't give mothers and fathers the simple chance to take some time off from work when a baby is born or a parent is sick. We are the party of Roosevelt. We are the party of Kennedy. So don't tell me the Democrats won't defend this country. Don't tell me the Democrats won't keep us safe. The Bush-McCain foreign policy has squandered the legacy the generations of Americans. Democrats and Republicans have built, and we are here to restore that legacy. Everybody knows that I recommended to the Congress a civil rights program. I did so because I believe it to be my duty under the Constitution. Some of the members of my own party disagree with me violently on this matter, but they stand up and do it openly. People can tell where they stand, but the Republicans all profess to be for these measures. But the 80th Congress didn't fail to act, and they had enough men there to do it, and they could have had culture. They didn't have to have a filibuster. There were enough people in that Congress that would vote for culture. But I believe that the times require imagination and courage and perseverance. 
I'm asking each of you to be pioneers towards that new frontier. My call is to the young in heart, regardless of age, to the stout in spirit, regardless of party, to all who respond to the scriptural call, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be dismayed. For courage, not complacency, is our need today. Leadership, not salesmanship. And the only valid test of leadership is the ability to lead and lead vigorously. A tired nation, a tired nation, said David Lloyd George, is a Tory nation. And the United States today cannot afford to be either tired or Tory. I do want to say something to the fathers in this country who have chosen to abandon their children by neglecting their child support. Take responsibility for your children or we will force you to do so. And Democrats, Democrats, we must also admit that fulfilling America's promise will require more than just money. It will require a renewed sense of responsibility from each of us to recover what John F. Kennedy called our intellectual and moral strength. Yes, government must lead on energy independence, but each of us must do our part to make our homes and businesses more efficient. Our end will not be won by rhetoric, and we can have faith in the future only if we have faith in ourselves. A president ought to be a powerful force for progress, but right now, I know how President Lincoln felt when General McClellan wouldn't attack in the Civil War. He asked him, if you're not going to use your army, may I borrow it? <laughs> and so I say, George Bush, if you won't use your power to help America, step aside, I will. I should make it very clear that I do not think we're doing enough that I am not satisfied as an American with the progress that we are making. This is a great country, but I think it could be a greater country. And this is a powerful country, but I think it could be a more powerful country. This country of ours has more wealth than any nation, but that's not what makes us rich. We have the most powerful military on earth, but that's not what makes us strong. Our universities and our culture are the envy of the world. But that's not what keeps the world coming to our shores. Instead, it is that American spirit, that American promise, that pushes us forward even when the path is uncertain, that binds us together in spite of our differences, that makes us fix our eye not on what is seen, but what is unseen, that better place around the bend. That promise is our greatest inheritance. It's a promise I make to my daughters when I tuck them in at night, and a promise that you make to yours. Our country is falling behind. The president is caught in the grip of a failed economic theory. We have gone from first to 13th in the world in wages since Reagan and Bush have been in office. He has raised taxes on the people driving pickup trucks and lower taxes on the people riding in limousines. We can do better. They keep telling us that if we convert more of our investments in education and research and health care into tax cuts, especially for the wealthy, our economy will grow stronger. They keep telling us that if we just strip away more regulations and let businesses pollute more and treat workers and consumers with impunity, that somehow we'd all be better off. We're told that when the wealthy become even wealthier and corporations are allowed to maximize their profits by whatever means necessary, it's good for America and that their success will automatically translate into more jobs and prosperity for everybody else. That's the theory. Now, the problem for advocates of this theory is that we've tried their approach on a massive scale. The results of their experiment are there for all to see. 
The Republicans running Congress right now have doubled down and proposed a budget so far to the right, it makes the contract with America look like the New Deal. In fact, that renowned liberal Newt Gingrich first called the original version of the budget radical and said it would contribute to right-wing social engineering. This is coming from Newt Gingrich. And yet this isn't a budget supported by some small rump group in the Republican Party. This is now the party's governing platform. This is what they're running on. One of my potential opponents, Governor Romney, has said that he hoped a similar version of this plan from last year would be introduced as a bill on day one of his presidency. He said that he's very supportive of this new budget. And he even called it marvelous, which is a word you don't often hear when it comes to describing a budget. Trickle-down economics has sure failed. He's never balanced a government budget, but I have 11 times. And it is a fact that through most of these last 25 years, the Republican leadership has opposed federal aid for education, medical care for the aged, development of the Tennessee Valley, development of our natural resources. He promised to balance the budget, but he hasn't even tried. In fact, the budgets he has submitted to Congress nearly double the debt. Even worse, he wasted billions and reduced our investments in education and jobs. We can do better. We'll tap our natural gas reserves, invest in clean coal technology, and find ways to safely harness nuclear power. We'll finally end our dependence on oil from the Middle East. Help our auto companies retool so that the fuel-efficient cars of the future are built right here in America. Keep our promise to every young American. If you commit to serving your community or our country, we will make sure you can afford a college education. One party is ready to move in these programs, the other party gives them lip service. And for most Americans, Mr. President, life's a lot less kind and a lot less gentle than it was before your administration took office. He won't take on the big insurance companies and the bureaucracies to control health costs and give us affordable health care for all Americans. Now is the time to finally keep the promise of affordable, accessible health care for every single American. Now is the time to help families with paid sick days and better family leave because nobody in America should have to choose between keeping their job and caring for a sick child or an ailing parent. Now is the time to change our bankruptcy laws so that your pensions are protected ahead of CEO bonuses and the time to protect Social Security for future generations. He won't break the stranglehold the special interests have on our elections and the lobbyists have on our government. He won't take the lead in protecting the environment and creating new jobs in environmental technologies for the 21st century. I hope the right to privacy can be protected and we will never again have to discuss this issue on political platforms. Our priorities must be clear. We will put our people first again. I'm not satisfied when many of our teachers are inadequately paid or when our children go to school part-time shifts. I think we should have an educational system second to none. But my fellow Democrats, it's time for us to realize that we've got some changing to do too. There is not a program in government for every problem. And if we want to use government to help people, we have got to make it work again. Cut taxes for 95% of all working families. Because in an economy like this, the last thing we should do is raise taxes on the middle class. Now, everybody would like to have low taxes. But we must reduce, reduce the national debt in times of prosperity. 
and when tax relief can be given, it ought to go to those who need it most and not go to those who need it least as this Republican rich man's tax bill did when they passed it over my veto on the third try. I'm not satisfied when we are failing to develop the natural resources of the United States to the fullest. Here in the United States, which developed the Tennessee Valley and which built the Grand Coulee and the other dams in the Northwest United States. But priorities without a clear plan of action are just empty words. To turn our rhetoric into reality, we've got to change the way government does business, fundamentally. Until we do, we'll continue to pour billions of dollars down the drain. The Republicans have campaigned against big government for a generation. But have you noticed? They've run this big government for a generation. And they haven't changed a thing. They don't want to fix government. They still want to campaign against it, and that's all. We cannot meet 21st century challenges with a 20th century bureaucracy. For a while, while Senator McCain was turning his sights to Iraq, just days after 9-11, I stood up and opposed this war, knowing that it would distract us from the real threats that we face. We need a president who can face the threats of the future, not keep grasping at the ideas of the past. You don't protect Israel and deter Iran just by talking tough in Washington. You can't truly stand up for Georgia when you've strained our oldest alliances. End this war in Iraq responsibly and finish the fight against al-Qaeda and the Taliban in Afghanistan. Rebuild our military to meet future conflicts. But I will also renew the tough direct diplomacy that can prevent Iran from obtaining nuclear weapons and curb Russian aggression. I will build new partnerships to defeat the threats of the 21st century, terrorism and nuclear proliferation, poverty and genocide, climate change and disease. The stakes are too high for this same partisan playbook. So let us agree that patriotism has no party. I love this country and so do you. The men and women who serve in our battlefields may be Democrats and Republicans and Independents, but they have fought together and bled together and some died together under the same proud flag. They have not served a red America or a blue America. They have served the United States of America. And big bureaucracies, both private and public, they fail too. That's why we need a new approach to government, a government that offers more empowerment and less entitlement, more choices for young people in the schools they attend, in the public schools they attend. And more choices for the elderly and for people with disabilities and the long-term care they receive. A government that is leaner, not meaner. A government that expands opportunity, not bureaucracy. A government that understands that jobs must come from growth in a vibrant and vital system of free enterprise. I call this approach a new covenant, a solemn agreement between people and their government, based not simply on what each of us can take but what all of us must give to our nation. Make certain those companies stop discriminating against those who are sick and need care the most. And that's what we have to restore. We may not agree on abortion, but surely we can agree on reducing the number of unwanted pregnancies in this country. The The reality of gun ownership may be different for hunters in rural Ohio than they are for those played by gang violence in Cleveland, but don't tell me we can't uphold the Second Amendment while keeping AK-47s out of the hands of criminals. I know there are differences on same-sex marriage, but surely we can agree that our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters deserve 
to visit the person they love in a hospital and to live lives free of discrimination. Passions may fly on immigration, but I don't know anyone who benefits when a mother is separated from her infant child or an employer undercuts American wages by hiring illegal workers. Now, this, too, is part of America's promise, the promise of a democracy where we can find the strength and grace to bridge divides and unite in common effort. Now, I know there are those who dismiss such beliefs as happy talk. They claim our insistence on something larger, something firmer and more honest in our public life is just a Trojan horse for higher taxes and the abandonment of traditional values. And that's to be expected. Because if you don't have any fresh ideas, then you use stale tactics to scare voters. If you don't have a record to run on, then you paint your opponent as someone people should run from. You make a big election about small things. And you know what? It's worked before. Because it feeds into the cynicism we all have about government. When Washington doesn't work, all its promises seem empty. If your hopes have been dashed again and again, then it's best to stop hoping and settle for what you already know. I get it. I realize that I'm not the likeliest candidate for this office. I don't fit the typical pedigree, and I haven't spent but what the people are in state, people of every creed and color, from every walk of life, is that in America, our destiny is inextricably linked, that together, our dreams can be one. We cannot walk alone, the preacher cried. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. America, we cannot turn back. Not with so much work to be done. Not with so many children to educate and so many veterans to care for. Not with an economy to fix and cities to rebuild and farms to save. Not with so many families to protect and so many lives to mend. America, we cannot turn back. We cannot walk alone at this moment. In this election, we must pledge once more to march into the future. Let us keep that promise, that American promise, restore our moral standing so that America is once again that last best hope for all who are called to the cause of freedom, who long for lives of peace, and who yearn for a better future. The American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. The country can't afford another Republican Congress. Recall with me the words of Isaiah, that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. As we face the coming great challenge, we too shall wait upon the Lord and ask that he renew our strength. Then shall we be equal to the test. Then we shall not be weary. Then we shall prevail. But just remember what the scripture says. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And in the words of scripture, hold firmly, without wavering, to the hope that we confess. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America.